Yeah. No, I'm really, I'm so excited, so excited to, to have you here and to learn from you today because you have done such tremendous things with your book. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And it's your first time author. Yes. Wrote a nonfiction. Yes. Badass Your Brand. Badass Your Brand. Um, so tell us a little bit about, from the very beginning, what, what first of all, what made you decide to self-publish? Well, um, I thought about, I mean, I considered for a second, you know, well, I guess I should get an agent and go pitch publishers. Um, but that was a very short-lived idea because as I looked into it a little bit more, I realized how long that process was going to be. And really... A year and a half, two years. Oh, my gosh. And, and really also how much um, control I was going to have to give up <laughs> over my book. And that was enough for me. Um, I knew I wanted to write this book. I knew what I wanted to be about. And I did not want somebody else telling me I couldn't say whatever it was that I was going to say. So that was one big thing. And the other, uh, or I guess the third reason, was that I, I thought about what the goal of this book was for myself. And the goal for me was to raise my thought leadership status. I wanted people to learn about my philosophy and approach to branding and small businesses and I wanted them to respect what I had to say so that they would look to me for as a as a thought leader so that they would look to me as an authority on the subject. And because of that, it didn't feel like going the traditional publishing route was really necessary. It felt like what was more important was to make this book exactly as I wanted and to get it into the hands of as many people as possible. And I knew I could do that with self-publishing, so that's why I did it. So you didn't believe that publishers would help you get into more hands? Uh, I didn't believe that at the time, based on who I was, mm -hmm. that I was going to be able to get a deal where they were going to put any significant resources behind right. marketing me. Everything that I read told me that I was really going to have to market it myself anyway. Yeah. So I figured I might as well do that unencumbered. Right. And tell us, just leaping into the future a little bit, how it went in terms of establishing you as a thought leader. Oh, well, it's been tremendous. I mean, I, I cannot recommend it highly enough <laughs> that you write a book yeah. uh, about your core ideas because everybody that reads my book that it resonates with, um, you know, they become, they, they join my community and my world, they join my list, they join my Facebook group, they follow me, um, some of them join my program, some of them hire us for services, um, and, and I have more and more over the years, it's really amazing how now when people come to me, they've all read my book, so they know me, they feel like they know me pretty intimately, they trust what I have to say, so especially when they hire us to do our service, it's like, Pia, do your thing, you know, like we trust you, you know what you're talking about. And that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted clients who trusted me implicitly so that I could do my best work for them. And my book has been uh, tremendous in aiding that. And it just draws the right people to you, right? Well, yeah. Because, because your <laughs> message resonates with them and they know your message and they've read so much about it. That's yeah, I mean, that's the, um, that's a, a, a lot of my approach in general is be yourself all the way in a very extreme way so that you have this magnetic attraction with the people that are perfect for you yeah. and you kind of repel everybody else. Um, and that I think that my book has, has done that. I mean, that's been my experience anyway. And that made sense why you didn't work with a publisher because you wanted to have such a strong, edgier message and brand and you were afraid they would dilute it. I was certain they were not going to let me do everything that I wanted to do. And actually, I spoke to, at one point, uh, a potential PR company to hire, somebody who was um, works in the traditional publishing space. And this is a perfect example of that. Um, she told me that my cover should be much like a lot of the other yeah, oh, so we can, we can show it. Yeah. So my cover is obviously my face, big, and that was a decision that me and my partner made because we said, what is the purpose of this book? The purpose is to build up my authority and to build up my personal brand. So having my face on the book 
means that if you read this book, I mean, you're looking at my face, you know who I am. Yeah. So we thought that was really important for our goals. This PR woman who is in traditional publishing said, you shouldn't put your face on the book. You should definitely do some sort of line drawing like many of the books. You know, she brought out a whole bunch of comparable books and she said, like Malcolm Gladwell books, yeah. very simple with yeah. this little line drawing. And do what everyone else does. Yeah, do yeah. what everyone else yeah. does. And actually the, the process that um, Steve, my, my partner and husband who designed the cover, uh, the process he used is he, he, we put a, uh, an image together of a bunch of books that this kind of falls into a similar category with and then he mocked up mine on that and we wanted to see if it stood out and so we decided that this was the photo and this was the one that stood out and I think I mean I think it does that that's a great way of doing it so if someone sees it on Amazon or in the book yeah are they gonna stop up? the yeah. scroll yeah 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 that's great um, so let's talk a little bit about your writing process because I thought that that was pretty unique how long it took you and um, and the structure that you know fell in place yeah, yeah well so I would say I really started writing this in, um, in July. And I say really because I had been kind of talking about and writing it for at least a year or two before that. But I hadn't actually sat down and said, I'm going to do this. The so, ideas were percolating. Yeah, and yeah. I kept kind of talking about this book I wanted to write. But it was the beginning of July 2016 uh, where I actually put a plan in place with goal setting. So I actually had a plan to have a draft in three months. So once I did that, I actually did have a rough draft three months later. It was a running Google Doc, so it wasn't very structured, but I had all my ideas down on paper. Do you remember, I know this is a nitty gritty question, but how many hours you devoted on a weekly basis or what that looked yeah, like? Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty intense worker, so I probably worked on it in, in a couple stints every week. Okay, yeah. I'm not, it wasn't like, oh, write for an hour each day. It right. was like I wrote all day, once a week maybe, gotcha. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I had all these ideas in my head, so it was really just about putting them on paper. Yeah. And uh, so I had that rough draft. It was just this long, winding story, and I actually had a friend of mine who's an author read it, and he gave me some really concise feedback, but it, it was tremendously helpful. He said, like, this is great. I love a lot of the stories. What I recommend is putting a structure in place for yourself for every chapter. So uh, that was all he said, but he said, you know, kind of have the chapters follow a similar structure throughout the book. Mm -hmm. So I decided my structure was going to be, okay, let me start with a story about my, my, uh, my business, the lesson I learned from that story, case studies showing that story, um, a personal story, that relates to it and then uh, like kind of a to-do for the readers at the end. And that was so phenomenally helpful because what it did was it allowed me to now pick out the lessons, the stories, the case studies, match them all up and then put them into a, a manuscript that was basically ready to show an editor. Yeah. Um, it also showed me where the holes were. So, oh, okay, chapter four, is missing the case study that supports this lesson. It just made it so much more tangible for me to actually get it to a place where I was ready to show it to somebody. Right, and it, it was probably easier to write it or rewrite it at that stage as well, right? I have this piece and then... Exactly, yeah. I kind of almost had a checklist yeah. to know that it was in good form. That's awesome. Um, so then, after that three month period, you did some self-editing Mm -hmm. for a number of months, right? Yep, so that was my next three-month goal. <laughs> was, I was doing this in three-month chunks, yeah. actually. The whole thing was in three-month chunks. Um, so my next three months was self-editing and getting it into that structure. And then it was at the end of December that I contacted you and said, Natasha, what do I do? Yeah. I have this manuscript. Yeah. I don't know anything about editing, but I want this to be well-edited. <laughs> yes because you wanted to publish it at a professional level. Yeah. Though it was self-published, yeah. I, I figured I will invest the time and resources into doing this as professionally as I possibly can. Yeah. I, you know, I have a professional graphic designer at my fingertips, so yeah. it's gonna look really good, so yeah. I might as well make sure that it reads really well, Yeah. obviously. So what was the editing experience like? So uh, the first round was more of uh, kind of a conceptual edit, um, and she gave me amazing feedback. 
throughout the book, places where things could be clearer, places that could use a story. Um, I just, I don't remember all the details, this was a couple years ago, but I do remember specifically her pointing out in certain places, this would really uh, come to life more with dialogue. So she just pointed things out like that, which were really easy uh, actions for me to take which is what I needed. I didn't need some sweeping yeah, <laughs> feedback. Yeah, it was like, yeah. hey, in this section, yeah. if you could add a little dialogue, it would yeah. make it a lot better. Yeah. So I was able to do all of that. And then the next um, round of editing, she actually went through and I, I guess she, line by line. I mean, the yeah. whole thing was yeah. marked up so that every sentence was much tighter. Uh, yeah. And that was tremendously helpful because once I read my own writing a few times, the sentences make sense, and then when she would shorten them, which I like to be concise, when she would shorten them, I'd be like, oh my God, that was such a meandering sentence that I didn't even realize because I've just looked at this way too many times. So that was really helpful. That's, that's always the case. I mean, you just can't. Is it? Can't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. It's not just me? Can't. Oh, no. Okay. I mean, that's a big reason editing. why editing. Okay. <laughs> because you just can't see it from that objective yeah. sort of yeah, point of view. Awesome. Um, so you go through the editing process. Um, what does the book launch look like? What, yeah. Um, so the book launch was its own project. I mean, I would say almost separate from the writing and editing and preparing of the book. Right. Uh, about November, I started to think about the marketing aspect of it. Because again, my goal was to use this to raise my visibility and my platform, and the marketing was gonna be a key piece of that. So in November, I realized I have to build a personal brand. <laughs> I don't have, my face isn't it's anywhere. Really, yeah. Like I don't have a personal, I don't even have a personal Instagram account. I have nothing. Yeah. So I opened an Instagram account, I opened a Twitter account, I had a bunch of professional photos taken. That's where this photo came from. Um, and uh, I just started to try to build a following online in preparation for my March launch. And then I started to do a lot of research into marketing tactics for a book. Um, and January, February, I guess it was only January and February. I, in retrospect, I wish I had given myself a lot more time. Yeah. Um, How much more time? I mean, was the next time around, yeah. I'll, I'll give myself a solid four or five months to do the, the ramp up for the marketing. Okay. Um, yeah. Because there were just, I mean, you can do endless marketing for a book. I mean, there were so many things I wanted to do. So I had to pick and choose and give my best efforts to the strategies that I decided to employ. And which strategies did you use that really you think moved the needle? Well, so one of the big things I did, um, I really wanted reviews. So, you know, I'm self-published, yeah. Amazon. I know how I feel when I find a book and it has four reviews and they're yeah. all five stars. Yeah. You're like, that's their mom, their dad, yeah. <laughs> and their brother. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't want that to be the case. So yeah. I felt like I needed to get to 100 reviews as quickly as possible. So that was my goal. Um, so I, I put this whole plan together to get these reviews. Uh, I actually tapped 100 individual people in my network, um, friends, family, people that were already on my list, and I specifically individually got them to agree that they would read a PDF version of my book ahead of time and then write a review the day it was published. So this is huge. 100 people, you're not sending a forum letter to everyone, no. you're not making it easy on yourself. No. You're specifically saying, okay, 10 people today or whatever it is, Catherine, I'm sending you a PDF. No, I said, Catherine, would you be willing, if I sent you a PDF, to yeah. promise to write me a review on the day that it's launched? And, you know, and got them yeah. to agree first. Yeah. And then, and then I had a whole schedule of following up, pre preparing them, reminders the week or two before, reminder, like this is coming up, you know, so I wanted them to be really ready and bought in. And I had a whole spreadsheet of their names and their emails, keeping track of who yeah. said yes, keeping track of who yeah. said they would. Um, From a psychological perspective, getting that easy yes is the key, right? That first, that's why you were looking for just, you didn't send it to them. No. You needed to get the yes. Yes. No, I needed them to agree and be bought in. Yeah. Um, 
yeah. And then I, I, and then when the time came, well, let's just, oh, yeah. so, so a certain percentage of people, I knew they together. wouldn't all do it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you keep contacting the people who didn't all do it? Who didn't respond? I assume some people just said, I don't have the time or whatever. Oh, then I left those people alone. Yeah. I was yeah. looking for a hundred people who said, yes, I will write you a review. Without, so you didn't follow up on people that, who didn't respond? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. No, no. So that was the first, okay. Yeah. So a hundred people agreed. Yeah. Uh, I sent them the review, I mean the book. Okay. Um, then I sent reminders and such. And then the week of, you know, I let them know you don't have to buy the, like, I'm looking for an honest review. I'm not asking for yes. a five star review. I don't care actually. Like, yeah. by all means, if you don't like yeah. it, put a negative review because I, Want yeah. them to know that these are real reviews. I think you know what you you had the language down so perfectly. I think I'll I'll share that. Okay. <laughs> if you if you're okay. Yeah. With no, it. that's yeah. fine. That's yeah. fine. I don't even I don't uh, remember exactly, but I remember saying like I'm not looking for a five star review. I'm looking for an honest review. And yeah. honestly, I would like you if you didn't like it or it wasn't applicable to say why because I want people who buy the book to resonate with it. So if it's not for them, yeah. I don't want they them don't to want buy to, it and exactly. read it. Exactly. And then. Perfect feel like it wasn't for them. They yes. didn't like it. Yes. Um, so then I think that week of, I, t I sent an email out saying, I don't, at this point they were, I wasn't individually emailing them, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I did let them know, you know, okay, so it's launching tomorrow, whatever. Um, oh, oh, I did this whole other thing too. Yeah. I have to remember yeah. exactly. So then I did a separate thing I think it was separate, just like a bigger list, mm -hmm. where I said, if you pre-order the book, because when you pre-order the book on Amazon, yeah, yeah. it counts as a sale on the day that it launches. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to get as many pre-orders as possible because the higher the sales on the day it launches, the more likely you'll get that like bestseller mm -hmm. or hit that. Yeah. Uh, so I said, anybody who pre-orders the book I will send you a PDF copy now, and if you send me the, the receipt, like yeah. screenshot the receipt, and I did like a free webinar like about some concept in the book about um, pricing your services to freedom. So I said, and you'll be invited to this live training that I'm going to do just for people who pre-order the book. That's great. So I had this marketing thing. So again, yeah. like incentives to yeah. buy the book, yeah. um, to my to my people who agreed to do a review, I, I told them you don't have to uh, buy the book, but if you do, also, you know, I think I just said to them, like, thank you for the review, no matter what, but it would really help me out if you pre-ordered yeah. the book, you know, because yeah. I wanted as many people to buy it as possible. Yeah. Most of the people did. Yeah. Um, and, and then afterwards, I did, I did keep track of all the people who sent the reviews, and, uh, and then I did follow up individually a few times with everybody who didn't. And, and a lot of them did. I don't remember how many of them ended up writing reviews. But I had a, a good chunk of reviews. I mean, I mean 50 or 60 probably. Yeah. I remember it was around mid-May, so about two months later, that I think I actually hit 100. Because I feel like it was right around my birthday. Okay. Um, that's a nice birthday gift. That's how I remember. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So, it, you know, even with all these efforts, it yeah. took me another two months to get to that 100. And that had been my goal. I just want 100 reviews. So now I have over 200 and I think almost 250. I think you have over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think of like 240. In that two-month period before you hit 100, were you still reaching out to people or did that become then? Yeah. So then I had this whole other thing I was okay. doing. Yeah. Because remember, I felt like the reviews were really yeah, important. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I had set up this whole funnel. Mm -hmm. So in my book, at, at the end of every chapter, I have this section called Shake Your Badass. And it's these questions that you can ask yourself to work on whatever the lesson of the chapter is. So we put all of that with some other information into a downloadable workbook. So the idea was to use our book to get people on our email list. Because mm -hmm. if you buy it on Amazon, we don't know who you are. We can't connect with you. Yeah. So you have to get people onto your email list. So we offered the workbook. And then anytime somebody downloaded the workbook, they went through a series of emails that eventually asked them if they would write a review on either Amazon or Goodreads. So this is just another way so from then on, 
you know, anybody who down, reads the book and downloads the workbook is going to be asked once or twice if they would do a review on Amazon. Now, I mean, I don't know how many people have downloaded the workbook, but I've had thousands and thousands of people read this book. So yeah. the fact that I only have 240 something yeah. reviews yeah, yeah. shows that it's, you know, there's so much drop off at every spot. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. But there is no question that putting that strategy in place is what has continued to get me reviews um, two years later. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm still getting reviews. Um, I'm, I consistently get reviews. Um, and then another big thing that I did right, right before and, and right after the launch is that I went on a lot of podcasts. So I hired a company to book me on a ton of podcasts. And I did Which it. company? Um, I hired a company called Interview Connections. They did a great job. Probably in that month or two, I was on 25 podcasts. That's great. And for all of them, I believe I gave them a free download. I gave them a link. I said, I have this, uh, I gave away this brand shrink interview that I do uh, to anyone who was listening. And I said, and you'll also get a free chapter of my book. So the first chapter. So then everybody gets the first chapter of my book. And then at the end of the chapter, there's a link in the PDF to go buy the book on Amazon. So you can see like all the marketing was going towards, okay, the chapter, and then you'll download the book and then you'll want to download the workbook and then you'll be offered the review. So yeah. creating that system, uh, you create it once and then it kind of lives forever. That's great. Did do the podcast still, you think, was it, I mean, obviously it's most effective at the very beginning when they're fresh, but do you still think they have a longer shelf life? Do, do oh, you, yeah. Do? Oh, I continued to do podcasts after oh, that. Okay. I've probably because been on a hundred podcasts at this point. Wow. Um, but it was, I, I did the constant, I, I couldn't keep up yeah, yeah. 25 podcasts in a month. I just did that for the launch. Yeah. And then uh, I had hi I hired them for the year, actually. So they, they booked me on about four podcasts a month. So I did that for a Perfect. while. Perfect, yeah. yeah. Podcasts are supposed to really move books. So Yeah, I mean, it's a really easy way to get a lot of information from somebody. So giving away the free chapter. Yeah. Um, you have to have like a pithy summary of what, why the chapter itself yeah. is interesting. So, you know, my first chapter kind of overviews how we went from $40,000 in debt to $500,000 in one year without advertising. So if you, so usually on podcasts, I'm talking about different parts of it. And then, you know, my call to action is, so if you want to hear about that story, you can download the first chapter of the book. Perfect. And that's what you did with the book as well itself. No advertising. It was yeah, no, I, I organically, mean, yeah. Well, I would call all of this advertising. <laughs> right, but not in the paid advertising. It's not paid. No, I, yeah. I did a little... Uh, Facebook marketing. I tried some Facebook marketing um, a little. I probably spent about $10,000 on Facebook uh, marketing yeah. to download the chapter one. It was really hard to track where that, um, how much that was bringing in. I definitely got a lot of people downloading the first book. Mm -hmm. In the end, because of the metrics and because of how much I make on the back end of a book, you know, I, I had an idea of how many people I thought would have to buy in order for it to break even. Yeah. I ended up turning them off and kind of felt like my sales stayed the same. So it's not that sales didn't come from it, but I don't think it necessarily, I didn't do a great job of, I mean, who knows? I'm not a Facebook ads expert. Right. Um, but I mean, you're, you're pretty close to being I, an expert. <laughs> I'm an expert compared to people who don't know what they're doing, <laughs> but I don't have a Facebook ad company. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is about Facebook ads and this kind of stuff in general is there's a lot of different ways that people can become customers over time. Yeah. So just even having people opt into the list because they downloaded the free chapter, some of them are going to buy the book, some of them might buy something else, some of them might just share it with a friend. I mean, there's so many things. So sure. it's not that it's always worth it, but there's kind of intangible value that you can get from that kind of investment. But you didn't feel like there was, even in your sign-ups, there wasn't like a, a clear drop-off after you turned off the ads. You know, I wasn't keeping it enough track. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so okay, I can't, I can't yeah, speak yeah, to it too yeah, much. But that was the only, I, my point is, I didn't feel enough of a bump from it yeah. to keep it going. Right. Um, but that was the only paid 
stuff that I really tried. Okay. Another thing I did that I really, I think I had good results from, is that I did a book bub. That's great, yeah. Book bub uh, campaign. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I tr I pitched them to do a like one dollar uh, campaign. Yeah. And they denied it. They get so many pitches. Yeah. And then I pitched them again for a free one, and I got it. They they emailed me like, "Hey, we have an opening for tomorrow. Do you want it?" I think it was like December twenty second, so it was right before Christmas. So I just took it because I thought, well, fine. And I got like twenty thousand uh, twenty thousand downloads wow. from that. Wow. So in what know, period of time? Do you remember? Oh, time? like like two days. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? People downloading a book for free. I mean Right, sure. It's not not as many of them will read it, but not still as many we're talking read about it. twenty thousand. Exactly. Who, so that yeah. was a uh, that was a great uh, little experiment too. And you couldn't track them afterwards. No, it's just like the book in more people's hands. I mean the yeah. only way I would know I wouldn't know that they came from that unless they said it in their review or told me. But there's no question a chunk of those people read the book and downloaded the workbook and got yeah. on my list. And so, of course, it's worth it. No, of course. That's awesome. Is there anything else that you would advise um, people to do who are in the earlier stages of either thinking about writing the book or in progress? I mean, just the very, I think just even approaching a book where you put as much energy into planning and executing the marketing of it as you do the writing of the book. The book, you ha it has to be good. You know, I did. I invested in professional editing and wanted it to be a compelling read and all of that. Um, but I think a lot of people publish the book and just hope it does well, and they don't think about any of this. Well, how am I going to get it into more people's hands? Um, I, I know that a lot of people, because they tell me that a lot of people recommend my book to their friends, so there is a word of mouth component, but you still need a lot of people to read it first in order for that word of mouth component to even come into play. Yeah, you need the tipping point, because if five yes. people read it, even if they talk about it... I mean, how far is that going to yeah. go? Yeah. So uh, I really think just thinking about and executing marketing and just being prepared to do that. I mean individually contacting a hundred people and going back and forth with them and getting their commitment is a lot of time and yeah, work a for a review on Amazon, yeah. but it adds up. And I think the difference between having five or six reviews on Amazon and having 105 is tremendous. It's true. It's true. And it just so happens that everyone basically gave you a five-star review. <laughs> Yes, I couldn't yeah, have so, anticipated yeah, that, but yeah. um, yes. And you didn't luckily, ask for it. Really, didn't I really didn't. You, you asked for an honest review, and that was yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that was really a really nice surprise and perk. <laughs> well, it's not, yeah, but it was all due to your work. I mean, your, your book delivers so much value to people. Thank you. But, yeah. So was the book another avenue to expand your speaking profile? Oh, yeah, that's a great speaker. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So that was another reason I wrote the book was, oh, I think I read, if you have a book, then you're more likely to get booked as a speaker. Yeah. Um, and I have definitely found that to be true. I've had people reach out to me to speak because they've read my book. Yeah. Um, I've also used my book as, uh, especially when I've spoken in, at events where Maybe they didn't have a speaker's fee. I'm, you know, well, if you buy a hundred of my books for the audience, then I'll come. Because to me, it's not really about the money in that case. It's like, well, if I can get a, my book into a hundred people's hands, that's pretty great. Yeah. And they're the right audience because they're exactly to to. if yeah. they're the right audience. So yeah. I've also had people ask me to come speak and they'll buy the books and they're not the right audience and to me well that's not worth it I don't I don't want to spend the time speaking to a group of people who are not my target client yeah. and getting the books into their hands yeah. that's not gonna help me meet my goal yeah. so those those people I tend to quote a higher speaking fee because it's really I, I'm just getting paid to show up and right uh, and give the speech so I'm only willing to do it just for the book sales in certain situations when they are the ideal group of readers. Perfect. Um, and do you, 
uh, it's hard to track, but do you feel like um, that's a good return based on their a the actions that the audience takes later on? It's really hard to track. Hard to track. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I got um, this piece of advice from um, Mike Michalowicz, who yeah. wrote Profit so First and The Pumpkin Plan. Love his books. Um, I was lucky enough to be introduced to him through a mutual friend of ours. And, uh, and I asked Ooh. him, Daniela. Oh, Daniela. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so Danielle introduced me, and so I asked him, well, what advice would you give me? And he said, oh, he gave me two great pieces of advice. One, he said, you definitely need to have an Audible version, mm -hmm. because in his experience, like, half his sales come from Audible. So I did that, and I had a professionally recorded audio book. Um, where Which, I, for nonfiction, is really important, uh, just to... Yeah. yeah. I, well, yeah, that's what he said, and, and he was right. I mean, I, I get a, a chunk of sales from my Audible um, every month. And uh, he said, once you write a book, you're always selling the book. So yeah. don't forget that. Yeah. Like, you want to be marketing and pushing this book forever because the book is the entrance to your business. So just realize that whenever you're anywhere, it's like even if you just sell a copy to somebody or get a copy in somebody's hands, that is really valuable. You never know who that person is. So just always be selling your book. Okay, good advice. And it's worked so well for you that book number two is in the ideation phase. I'm so excited for book number two. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and now that I've done it once, you know, I learned what worked and what maybe didn't work, and where I should put a lot more of my time and energy. Um, my whole review thing, I'll probably do that at a much larger level the next time. Because it works so well. Because it works so well. What about the social media component? You mentioned that you had created the Instagram mm -hmm. handle. And did that, was that worthwhile? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. there, you know, I think the social media also was about portraying a whole personal brand. So mm -hmm. I did a lot of posting and engaging and um, strategic work. I mean, I, I took a course on doing Instagram, which by the way, that was two years ago, like what I did then wouldn't even work now. But at the yeah. time I did the strategies that worked then. Yeah. And I think I built my followers, you know, thousands over a few months. Wow. Um, yeah. And I think that there was an, uh, intangible value to even that you know you go and you hear about somebody's book and they have thousands of followers on Instagram and Twitter that all makes sense um, yeah. if you have like 500 followers on Instagram and Twitter and you have this book you just look at the book differently right uh, so I think it was valuable for that uh, but I also there's no question people on Instagram and Twitter are also people who end up buying my book because they like what I have to say and then you know I would link to the first chapter and yada yada they'd go through my whole funnel again. And I feel like the the personal more personal images really sort of give a different experience of who you are and and um, you know the brand. And I feel like that's why when you look up names now it sort of auto adds Instagram because so many people tend to want to you know well let me see what this person is really like in a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think also my Instagram is some of the stories from the book, other That's stories. Cool. So if you like these stories and these case studies and all of this, then you're going to like reading what I have to say on Instagram and Twitter. 